Hey everyone, this is Caroline Friday Neighborhood Bible Study. Today we're finishing up chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. We just completed the Easter weekend or Resurrection Day weekend, and yesterday was Easter or Resurrection Day, which is a perfect segue into the final part of chapter 3 of Ruth because we see in this book that Ruth has gone to Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, and has asked him to redeem her from this life of being cursed, a Moabite widow, and to bring her into a place where she can find rest and contentment and can have a life in Israel that uh, is full of peace. And when we look at the resurrection day, um, if you think about it, what is the one thing that so many people are fearful of? Death. Um, they're fearful of death, of dying physically and going to a place that they know not of, having an eternal life. There's something in us. Um, Ecclesiastes says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. There's something in us that just knows that we're going to live forever. The question is, where will you live? Will you live in a place of peace or will you live in a place of tor a torment and turmoil? Um, and so people don't know where they're going. And anytime you are going to a place and you don't know if it's good or bad, you're going to be very fearful and very afraid. Um, and so death is the ultimate enemy. It is the final enemy we read in the book of Revelation. Um, when we get our new bodies, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and we get our new bodies, Paul tells us that death, the sting of death will be removed when we become immortal. Now, so many people have trouble with that. They can't understand how believing in Jesus can uh, help them escape death. Um, they look at many of us Christians and they see us in the same bodies and doing the same thing and struggling and being afflicted. And they say, well, why do I want that? Um, and so many of us, I believe, have been under false teaching and under deceptive teaching so that we don't really know all the wonderful things that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us when he went to the cross and when he rose up. That empty tomb is a sign that death was defeated. And when those people went in that tomb and they saw those grave clothes, and if you do a little research, you'll see a hundred pounds of spices were used to anoint his grave clothes. If anybody, if you've had a broken leg, you'll know that that's like a cast. And I believe that what they saw was like a, a hard cast um, where those grave clothes had had that a uh, anointed um, oil on it and it had hardened and it was like a cocoon and then of course the face napkin was folded in a different place which we know from tradition means that he is coming back but um so the sign of the empty tomb and the grave clothes being there and he wasn't around was the ultimate sign and the stone being rolled away i mean how much did that stone weigh um, what about the Roman guards or the Jewish guards? What about those guys? Um, all the miracles that had to take place in order for him to manifest the fact that he defeated death, hell and the grave, and was raised up. Um, that is the ultimate sign of the Lord Jesus Christ conquering death. Go look at the Passion of the Christ. That is a really tough movie to watch. I've seen it several times. To endure that kind of suffering and to endure death on a cross and then to be in the grave for three days and three nights and then to be raised up out of those grave clothes, um, all of that, all of that is the abundant signs that we need to um, stand on that he's overcome death. He's overcome physical death, and he's overcome spiritual death. And, and that's what gives us peace. And the only thing I can say is that if you can surrender your mind, your intellect, put your intellect aside and surrender to that and allow your heart 
to receive that truth, you will become born again and you will become a new creation. And some of these things that don't make sense to you today will begin to make sense because they're spiritually discerned. They're not naturally discerned. Natural men cannot understand these things. You know, I just saw that movie, The Theory of Everything. The smartest, most intelligent men in the world have to surrender their intellect to accept God. And many of them cannot do it. They can't do it. And it's almost as though their intellect becomes a curse to them and becomes such a huge hindrance. Um, many wealthy people are the same way. Their wealth and their money are huge hindrances that keep them from accepting the truth that Jesus has overcome death. And by believing in him, accepting him, confessing him as your Lord and Savior, you too will escape death. But your money will not enable you to escape, escape death, nor will your intellect, nor will all your scientific advancements. Uh, if you find a way to freeze your body and preserve it for a thousand years so that you can be woken up and cured of, a, of a age and death, um, that still won't satisfy the spiritual death that that you're suffering from. And that's the worst kind of death because you become subject to the God of this world. You become a deceived one. You become part of his kingdom and you're destined, destined to perish. So the spiritual birth, the spiritual death are the things we should be most concerned with. But again, the irony is the natural man can't understand it. Well, let's look at Ruth because Ruth is one who in her natural uh, circumstances is destined to perish. She's a, Mo a Moabitess from Moab, a very evil culture, but she's been given the invitation to accept a new life in Israel, in Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, a righteous Jewish lady. I call her righteous because um, Naomi believes in God and honors God and has shared this God with her pagan, heathen uh, daughter-in-law. So I, am, I conclude that Naomi is a righteous Jewish lady. She's a little bit deceived into thinking that God has cursed her and has dealt her a very bitter hand. But she has not lived out the full story yet. And once she lives out the full story, she'll see she was very wrong. Many of us, we, we go years and years and years thinking God's hand is against us. And then something happens and we look back and we say, oh, God really was for us. He was working on our behalf the whole time and we didn't know it. And praise God, he was there and he was opening doors that no man could shut and opening uh, and closing doors that no man could open and all that to protect us and to lead us and guide us into the place that he wants us to be. Well, we see that Ruth took those first steps. She set aside her revelation that I'm just a Moabitess and this is the best I can do. She set that aside. She set her circumstances aside and she said, you know what? I'm going to follow my mother-in-law into this new life. I'm going to follow her and I'm going to believe in this God. She was commended for that by everyone in, in the city of Bethlehem. She is known as a virtuous woman, Boaz tells her. Um, Boaz condemned, uh, uh, commends her for believing this way. And then he goes further and commends her for coming to him and asking him to be her kinsman redeemer when she had ample opportunity to go a different way. She could have married somebody else. She could have married a young man. She could have done a million other things with her life. But she chose the kinsman redeemer. She chose what her mother-in-law wanted was a place of rest with a righteous Jewish man. And go to him and ask him to be your kinsman and redeemer. And again, I, as we discussed last time, he's an older man. I do not see anywhere in these scriptures that um, lead me to conclude that either Naomi or Ruth considered him to be a viable husband that who could bring children to, to Ruth. I, I just don't believe that that's there. Now, that's my interpretation 
perhaps others could believe differently. But uh, Naomi wanted Ruth to have a place of rest. And so we see that Ruth went at night in a very intimate way, not seductive, but in a very intimate way, went to the threshing floor where uh, Boaz was threshing the barley. And we see a lot of symbolism there because the barley are the first fruits. And we know that Israel, Israel are the first fruits. The Jewish believers in Jesus were the first fruits. They were the first ones who believed. We know that barley is much easier to thresh than wheat. And that made sense. It, it, it should have been much easier for a Jewish person to believe in Jesus because the very oracles of God were given to them. All the prophecies were given to them. They had the Old Testament. They had the Word of God. It, it should have been very simple for them to have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. And many did, but of course many did not. The wheat which is a little bit harder, harder to thresh, and that's the Gentiles, they, they were far from God. They didn't know the prophecies. They didn't have the Old Testament to look to. They had to come out of the pagan world system and accept Jesus Christ. And that's where many of us have come out of a pagan, heathen world system and accepted Jesus. Um, but anyway, so we see that we're in the barley harvest, first fruits, on the threshing floor, at night, intimate setting, and here comes the pagan, heathen, Gentile Moabitess who has forsaken her old life and has accepted this new and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The invitation is available to her. She accepts it. And Boaz is thrilled, thrilled that she has done this. When she could have gone a different way, he is thrilled. He calls her daughter, and he tells her that she is a virtuous woman. All of Bethlehem knows she's a virtuous woman, and that he will do this for her. He's going to do it. And we look on in verse 12. He says, it's true, I am a near kinsman. How be it there is a nearer kinsman than I? There's one closer than I who can redeem you. And we're going to see this is a nameless individual. And I believe this nameless individual represents the law. So many Jewish people, and the same is true in Jesus' time and true today, their Redeemer, they believe their redemption comes from the law, being born Jewish. Being born Jewish, keeping the law, makes them right with God. And what we're going to see from the story is, while the law certainly is righteous and certainly is good, and we've talked about this, it cannot redeem sinful man. It is opposed to sinful man because man's sin cannot coexist with God's lawful righteousness. Something has to happen in order for sinful man to come to a holy God and be a part of his family and a part of his body. Something unique has to happen. So let's read on. In verse 13, he tells her, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he, this other Redeemer, who has first place, if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another, and he said, let it not be known that a woman came unto the floor. Also, he said, bring the veil that thou hast with thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, and this is Naomi said, these 
Six measures of barley, actually this is Ruth said, these six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, this is Naomi, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he has finished the thing this day. Now the thing I love about this part of chapter three, and this, is, this ends chapter three, is that Boaz was very aware that he is a kinsman redeemer. He's very aware that he could redeem Ruth and Naomi and make all things right. But he waited for her to come to him. She had to choose him. And that is so true today. The Heavenly Father is wooing his children. You know, he knows in advance who will choose him and who will believe because he's sovereign. But he still woos us, and he wants us to exercise our free will and accept him because that's love. If someone forces you to be with them, that's not love. Love is when you choose out of your own free will to be in a relationship with someone, a close, intimate relationship. So Boaz was very aware that he could fix the situation in Naomi's life. But, uh, and in Ruth's life, but he had to wait for them to come to him. And when she did, and when she came to him in an intimate setting, not in a seductive setting, but an intimate setting where she lay at his feet and she humbled herself and asked that he be her protector, he was ready, willing, able to do it. But there's some unfinished business. And that is the same with the Lord Jesus Christ. He came as a baby in Bethlehem, grew up, started his ministry, not at age 12 when he went to Jerusalem and he debated the scriptures with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Nope. He had to wait until he was about 30 years old. And he was baptized by the Holy Spirit, water baptized, but spiritually baptized, began his ministry and began to share the good news of the gospel and to share that he is the redeemer of Israel. He is the one who has come to set Israel free from their sins. However, there's unfinished business. There's another redeemer that has to be dealt with. There's another redeemer. And we know that redeemer is the law. And if you go look in the New Testament Testament scriptures, you'll see that he fulfilled the law. Jesus, when he went to the cross, he took every sin on himself. He became the curse for the law because cursed is any man that hang on a tree, and that's from Galatians 3. He became the curse. He took all sickness and all disease, Isaiah 53 tells us, as well as Matthew 8. He bore all the sins and the iniquities of mankind. And he was the only one qualified to do that. And by taking all of that on to himself, absorbing it in his body, and taking death, which is the ultimate payment for sin and um, sin is identified when the law introduces itself. We don't even know what sin is until the law comes. Paul explains that, that to us in Romans 7. When the law comes, sin is identified, and condemnation, curse, and death are right there following behind as the wages of sin. But he took sin, he took the curse, he took condemnation, he took death, and by doing so, fulfilled the law. The law becomes obsolete. The old covenant becomes obsolete. It's no longer needed. And we've talked about how the law of God is written on our hearts. He pours his spirit out in, on us. And, and the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. If you've got the love of God in your heart, you do not need the Ten Commandments to know how to live on this earth. You're going to love God and you're going to love people and you will know not to kill anybody or not to lie, not to covet, not to steal. You're just going to know what to do. The sad reality is 
So many people in the world don't see that from Christians. Why? Because there are people who aren't truly born again sitting in the churches of denominations claiming to be Christians, and they are not Christians. They are not born again. And so they malign the word of God and they make it a mockery. We also have pastors and teachers who are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are not born again. They are not preaching the gospel of the the same gospel that Paul preached, the gospel of grace. They're preaching a different Jesus. Just because someone's preaching Jesus does not mean they're preaching the gospel. They could be preaching a totally different Jesus. Um, We we see uh, true born-again Christians deceived, thinking that they're still sinners, that they're destined to suffer and to uh, be weak and to muddle through life until they die and go to heaven. Well, you know, heaven is not our ultimate destination. We are destined to live on earth, new earth, the new Jerusalem. And so um, they've been deceived. And I was one of those people, deceived for years. And yes, we are appointed to affliction and appointed to persecution and appointed to trials, but we should not be persecuted because of the evil things we're doing, we should not be persecuted and suffer needlessly out of ignorance and deception. We should be suffering persecution from those who are trying to stop the word and trying to stop this gospel from advancing. But you know what Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome the world. This kingdom will advance. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So right here we see that Jesus, and he is our heavenly Boaz. This is a historical account, but it's also a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, and the Gentile church coming to him. But he's got to go and take care of this other near kinsman that has a claim on us, that has a right to redeem us. But we're going to see in this next chapter 4, that that near kinsman cannot do it, cannot do it. Well, we know the law cannot make us righteous. The law cannot do it. It's good, and it has a purpose. The purpose, ironically, is to reveal to us that we can't keep the law, that the law can't save us, that there is a need for another Savior someone who will come along and he'll, who will take and remove the law and take it out of our path and remove sin and remove death and remove all those hindrances and take us straight to the Father, directly to the Father, without any hindrance, without any condemnation, without any guilty conscience. And this is the gospel. This is the message that Ruth gets. Nowhere do you see anyone telling her, girl, you need to repent from being a Moabitess. You need to get on your knees and just uh, suffer because you were born in Moab. No, he tells her, you are a virtuous woman. You have done good by your mother-in-law. You have accepted this new God and these new people. You are worthy of being redeemed, and I'm going to go do it for you. And then I love how her mother-in-law, oh, he and he gives her the six measures of barley. He weighs her down with more gifts. See, he's not a stingy God. We've been told God is stingy. He is not stingy. The Lord give us and the Lord take us away. They quote, uh, you hear preachers quote Job. No, he's not a stingy God. He's a good God and he weighs her down. He weighs her down and with grain as proof to her mother-in-law, he is going to honor his word. And I love what Naomi says. And I have meditated on this scripture for weeks now. He said, daughter, uh, actually she says, daughter, sit still and know Uh, until thou knows how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he has finished the thing this day. You know, Jesus finished the work. He finished everything that needed to be done 
to get us right in the Father's lap, sitting in the Father's lap with our arms around him, crying out, Daddy, and him saying, yes, amen, yes, amen, whatever you do, uh, whatever you ask for uh, in, in my name, yes, amen. The Father's promises are yes and amen. And that is what was given to us when Jesus went to the cross. And this is exactly what Naomi tells Ruth is going to happen to her. Sit still, wait, for the man will not rest till he finishes the work. He's going to take care of you, Ruth. He's going to provide you a place of rest and a place of comfort. And look, he's weighed you down with these six measures of barley to prove it. So just sit still and don't worry. Now, how many of us could get such peace doing the same thing? Do you have something in your life that you need the Lord Jesus Christ to do? Are you crying out to your Heavenly Father saying, Heavenly Father, help me, help me. I need deliverance. Well, you know what? All of his promises in Christ are yes and amen. Sit still and rest and don't worry and, and have comfort in knowing your Savior did everything he needs to do for you. 2,000 years ago on the cross. And your heavenly father is going to do the work. He is going to open doors. He is going to make things right. He is going to satisfy that desire in your heart. Sit and wait. Don't get impatient and don't get up and try to make things right on your own. And all of us have done that and all of us have realized that gets us nowhere. So um, meditate on the, this be thankful. All of us just need to praise God and be thankful for what was done for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. The Lord Jesus Christ took all of that for us. He suffered. We'll never know how much he suffered, but he did it because he loves us. He did it out of obedience to his heavenly father. He did it so that we would be with him. And this is something we have to rejoice in every single day regardless of our circumstances, just rejoice in all the wonder and all the glorious things that were done for us on the cross. So let's stay in that spirit of Resurrection Sunday and um, read forward in your Bible and look at this book of Ruth and see yourself in the pages of this story because we're all here. We're All of us are here in this book of Ruth. So I'll see you next time. Have a blessed day.